Good evening, Alan Temple, and welcome back to another Theological Thursdays. It is so good to have you joining us, so good to be with you. Let me first extend my heartfelt thanks and appreciation to Reverend Dr. Martha Taylor, our church historian, for leading us through this period of Black history during the month of July. We talked about the history of the Black church, the history of policing, history of education, and how uh, racism has been present in all of those institutions. So we are grateful for every guest that came on and supported that and who lended their expertise expertise in that area. And tonight is no different. For those of you who don't know, Allen Temple Baptist Church is a part of a larger body of churches that are committed to liberation, freedom, and justice. And as such, we are part of the Progressive National Baptist Convention. And this week, over the last three days, PNBC has presented their first virtual conference. I was blessed to be a part of the steering committee that planned and executed that conference. And so what I have for you this evening is a very necessary conversation with some of the leading thought leaders around areas of social justice, activism, and faith. And so I'm going to share that with you tonight. And I am also eternally, eternally, eternally grateful to our emeritus who joined me on Tuesday in a discussion about the church, how we need to reimagine the church. So we are grateful for Reverend Dr. J. Alfred Smith Sr., who served as the 12th president of the Progressive National Baptist Convention. Also, we have other delegates, Deacon Michael Johnson, who has served with the laymen and so many others, Deacon Ross Spearman, for this has been a part of our church part of who we are. We are not a standalone institution. We work in conjunction with other like-minded individuals, those who share our theology and our values and our reading of scripture. So stay tuned for a very stimulating conversation. You're going to recognize some of these faces. They are friends of mine and friends of Allen Temple Baptist Church. Enjoy and engage. And I'll see you Sunday. Dr. Stewart and to all of our wonderful members of the Progressive National Baptist Convention, we uh, salute you even as we meet virtually uh, to continue to do the work of this uh, great prophetic witness, the Progressive National Baptist Convention. It is uh, of the essence that we have this session and we look forward to uh, the conversation. Again, I want to thank God for the visionary leadership of our uh, president, Dr. Stewart, uh, himself a prophet, uh, as well as a gift to the body of Christ, a uh, social justice activist who respects and recognizes uh, the rootage of the Progressive National Baptist Convention uh, that continues to bear prophetic fruit uh, because the rootage of our convention uh, provided a denominational home for uh, the drum major for justice, Martin Luther King Jr. And without question, we do not think of civil rights in the United States without thinking of the role of progressive National Baptist pastors. And so in this age of Black Lives Matter, it is essential that we have this kind of conversation. And I am super hyped uh, to welcome you to this session because we have uh, in this session, as far as I'm concerned, uh, some of the leading prophetic voices and social justice witnesses uh, that the world has at this time. And so I am excited uh, to introduce them. I feel like uh, I'm Magic Johnson playing for the Lakers back in the day of Showtime. All he had to do was bring the ball up the court. And then there was the alley-oop to Kareem or James Worthy because all he had to do was throw the ball up. And you know they're going to slam dunk it. We have uh, on this panel those kinds of s amazing stars. And so uh, I greet and welcome all of them. Uh, first of all, uh, I must greet uh, the queen herself. Uh, the incredibly brilliant uh, prophetic witness and warrior, Dr. Iva Carruthers. Dr. Iva Carruthers gives phenomenal leadership to uh, the Sam DeWitt Proctor Conference. This conference uh, has been used by God, uh, not just in the States, but even at the United Nations because of her uh, brilliant, visionary, and creative leadership. Uh, she is a scholar. Uh, she is a social justice activist, and so we welcome uh, Dr. Iva Carruthers. Dr. Iva Carruthers 
uh, indeed is going to bless us. We are also extremely excited to have uh, our uh, resident prophet, uh, the sage himself, the icon, uh, Dr. Otis Moss Jr. Dr. Otis Moss Jr. We already know is a analytical heavyweight champion. We already know that Dr. Otis Moss Jr. Uh, is a social justice activist. He understands how spiritual anointing and social activism go together. He has done that throughout his ministry. A lieutenant to the late great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. walked arm in arm, side by side with John Lewis, our beloved John Lewis, our beloved C.T. Vivian. And so to have uh, this preacher without peer, Dr. Otis Moss Jr. is indeed a blessing. We welcome you, Dr. Otis Moss Jr. And then uh, to have Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant. What's up, Maul? Dr. Oh, Jamal good. Harrison Bryant is, of course, we know, a preacher par excellence. We also know he is the pastor of the New Birth Church there in Atlanta, Georgia. New Birth, under his leadership, is not just experiencing revival, but Atlanta and Georgia is in the midst of a redemptive revolution uh, under his creative leadership. And so we are really excited uh, to have Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant. He has deep rootage in the NAACP. He was the national youth director for the NAACP. He served as pastor, founding pastor of the exciting and powerful empowerment temple there in Baltimore, Maryland, where God used him uh, to give leadership in the aftermath of the slaying of the lynching of Freddie Gray. Uh, right there on the front lines was Jamal Harrison Bryant. And even right now, uh, there is a governor in the state of Georgia who trembles every time he hears Jamal Harrison Bryant has called his name. And so we welcome uh, Jamal Harrison Bryant, Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant, and then Dr. Willie Francois, Morehouse's finest. We thank God for this prophet. Uh, just uh, earned his doctorate in ministry degree earlier this year. And again, he's someone who has graduated not only from Morehouse, but from Harvard, where he received his master's degree. And again, recently his doctorate in ministry. But Willie Francois is not just a pastor uh, who is doing the thing right there in New Jersey, but God is also using him uh, to help us uh, look at what social justice activism looks like in the 21st century. Whenever someone says, uh, we don't see anyone uh, from the uh, clerical community, from pastors uh, on the front lines of the Black Lives Matter movement, I'm quick to say, you haven't heard of Willie Francois then because Willie Francois is indeed not just a leader uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement, but Willie, Willie Francois represents the best in prophetic preaching. He represents the best uh, in, as it relates to progressive pastoral ministry. And so we welcome you, Dr. Willie Francois. Uh, thank you not only for your preaching phenomenality, but thank you for your social justice witness. So you see, with this kind of panel, all I'm gonna do is throw the ball up and look forward to y'all slam dunking. Uh, I wanna begin by simply reminding all of us what, again, you know, we are in the midst uh, in our community of a double pandemic. Uh, you have COVID, what, 19, but you also have COVID 16, 19. COVID 16, 19, uh, the spotlight uh, has been put afresh on COVID 16, 19 because of what has happened with, uh, with COVID-19. COVID-19, of course, uh, we have seen the disproportionate way that Black people uh, are dying because of COVID-19. We are tested least and dying the most uh, because of COVID-19. But COVID-19, again, that's just a reflection of COVID-16-19, 401 years where we have been subjected to the tyranny of the hypocrisy of America's practice of democracy. And so all of that 
is reflected in the disproportionate way that we are dying because of medical apartheid. Contrary to what our black surgeon general said when he had the nerve to say uh, that we need to uh, lay off the tobacco, the alcohol. He did not deal with the social determinants such as medical apartheid. He did not deal with zip code injustice where uh, David Williams of Howard says, that, of, of Harvard says that uh, black people, we don't die. Uh, our mortality is not because of our genetic code, but the zip code. It's zip code injustice, which is also reflected sadly uh, in environmental racism. All of those are part of COVID-16-19, but not just COVID-16-19 reflected in that, but it's also reflected in uh, the age of George Floyd, the age of, say her name, Brianna Taylor. Uh, all of that is a reflection of where we are in this season. I'm introducing this conversation because Henry Mitchell, in his wonderful book entitled Black Church Beginnings, says that uh, the Black church at her birth uh, during the evil of enslavement, uh, the Black church, every Black pastor converted their platform into their pulpit into a platform for abolition. I love it. Every black pastor converted their platform, their pulpit into a platform for abolition. The question becomes, what does abolition look like in this day? In the day of Breonna Taylor, in the day of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, in the day of COVID-16-19, the question is, what does it look like for us to convert our pulpits into platforms for abolition? I'm going to ask the Queen, uh, Dr. Iva Carruthers, to begin this conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Haynes. And I want to first begin by honoring the legacy of Samuel DeWitt Proctor, the yes. legacy of the organization that I have been so privileged to uh, facilitate and chart the course of over the last 18 years. I do so because he was so instrumental in the formative years of Progressive National Baptist Convention. And for us to be here and represent the Proctor Conference in partnership and collaboration with a PNBC is a statement and a testimony in and of itself as an answer to your question. Oh, yeah. Because one of the things I think that is so critical is that we figure out how we reimagine what it means to walk together, brothers and sisters, in a unified way so that we can reimagine a world in which uh, we are liberated and we are free. Um, the other kind of pandemic I want to lay on the table is the pandemic of a, of a theological an amnesia uh, in which I think that it's quite important for us to claim at this moment the extent to which we have indeed been traumatized. Right. Uh, there's been transgenerational traumatization as we have moved from the 1619 pandemic through um, this COVID-19 pandemic. And I think what that speaks to is a real need for us to lift up how we transform our pulpits into spaces that really address the soul healing that is required for us to even embrace this opportunity for reimagination. Yeah. That's how I'll begin. Yeah, thank you for that. You, you said something uh, at a board retreat a few years ago, Dr. Carruthers, uh, as it relates to this trauma and how it's been scientifically proven that the trauma of prior generations is cellularly, cellularly transferred from generation to generation. So, yes. so given how you've, 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 you've driven us in this direction, uh, what would you say? I want, I, want, I want you to keep talking about this. What would you say we should be doing to, to help our souls to heal? Uh, from this cellular transfer that not only comes from our history, but sadly, it's something we experience real time every single day. Well, I think one of the things we have to do is to um, dig deep into our souls and our theological imaginations to move away from performative uh, pulpits, which don't allow the people to penetrate the depth of their woundedness. Hmm. And so I think we contribute to, we wear the mask 
um, which only reinforces the epigenetics, which is the name of the science of our woundedness that we pass on from generation to generation. And so I think we have to do a mighty work of education, of creating spaces, of learning, of making some different assumptions about who's in the pew and who's not in the pew, and how does our ministry relate to those beyond the brick and mortar. Yeah. And if there is a silver lining in this moment, I think it's forced a lot of people, all of us, to look in the mirror, to have some moments of solitude, to begin to think differently about what it means not to worship brick and mortar, but what it really means to be servants of God and to be leaders of those in the pulpit. And I think we're all walking around as wounded warriors, trying to be wounded healers, and not really dealing with the woundedness at the level that we're going to have to deal with in order to imagine or reimagine a new world forward. Wow, wow, thank you for that, thank you for that. Dr. Otis Moss, of course, uh, as you know, this denomination was born uh, providing Martin Luther King Jr., your mentor, uh, a denominational home, this convention. We can't imagine this convention uh, without thinking of the legacy of Dr. Booth and William Augustus Jones and Gardner C. Taylor, uh, not to mention uh, Prathia Hall and, and all of those such as yourself who literally took the convention to the front lines of the civil rights movement and and, and led in providing the prophetic witness. And so, so I, I would just like to ask you, Doctor, give, given, again, your amazing career, uh, your, your phenomenal prophetic insight and witness, uh, what would you say are the social justice issues that should arrest our attention in this present age? Dr. Haynes, thank you so much, and to all of the distinguished leadership members of this panel and to Progressive Baptist Convention leadership and history. It is just an honor to share these fleeting moments with each of you and thank you for your overkind words of, of introduction. We ought to remember that the Progressive National Baptist Convention was born in danger, born in, in conflict, challenge, and suffering. Uh, I will not attempt to underscore all of that, but <clears throat> there were 33 voting members in the organizational meeting at Zion Baptist Church, Cincinnati, Ohio. 16 of them voted not to organize the Progressive National Baptist Convention, and 17 voted to organize. One vote. So the Progressive National Baptist Convention is in history today because of one vote one vote, and that can be carried out in so many instances throughout history, literally. We need to remember that the enemies of social justice never sleep, never resign, they never give up even when they are defeated momentarily, they do not surrender. They reorganize, they regroup and come back with poison, with danger, with hate, and with all kinds of demoralizing strategies. I underscore that because we have to remember that the enemies of social justice, the enemies of oppression, do not sleep, they do not give up, they do not surrender, and even when they are defeated, they do not 
concede. Secondly, the struggle, the struggle that we are in and that progressive undergirds, the progressive national convention undergirds, the struggle is an unending struggle. Just like that little 12 year old boy who came home in St. Louis a couple of years ago, and maybe three or four years ago, after being harassed uh, and wounded, so to speak, by the police, he was innocent, he was well-groomed, dressed, and his mother sat him down and told him what he had to expect, what he had, what he had to prepare for mentally, and all of these things in meeting the evil forces, and he finally asked his mother, how long must I prepare to endure this? And with tears, she said, all of your life, my Lord, all of your life. And that's where we are now. Those of us whose journeys are uh, approaching commencement, all of our lives, we must struggle with these injustices and meet on a daily basis all of these forces and help prepare our children and children's children to be in the struggle all of their lives. It's a never-ending struggle. Every parent, every child, every generation must be prepared constantly to be engaged all of our lives. Mm -hmm. And in the next place, we are all members of a lynched family, a lynched family. We all, all of us are members of lynched victims in our families. We may not be able to uh, underscore it each time, day, date, and year. I can. But whether you are a member of the family of Emmett Till or family of Breonna Taylor or the family of Martin Luther King Jr. or the family of those in this panel, there are lynchings in your family. And you don't have to do a whole lot of heavy research to find it. When I was 12 years old, our cousin was lynched not far from our hometown in Georgia. He was 42 years old. He owned 111 acres of land, a beautiful wife, and four lovely daughters. He was lynched in jail, locked up, because the sheriff said he felt that his life was in danger and he had to shoot him locked up bars in self-defense. Hmm. Self-defense locked up in chains behind bars and the sheriff never came to trial. Seventy years later, the granddaughter of the sheriff apologized. And when she apologized, I said to someone close to me, it reminds me of the writing concerning Joan of Arc. The story is told in an imaginary form that 400 years after the burning of Joan of Arc, the priests, the cardinals, and the popes, and all of the others got together to make her a saint, or to vote her into sainthood. And then they opened the meeting for discussion and gave, in this imaginary situation, Joan of Arc an opportunity to respond to her 
being elevated to sainthood and she raised a phenomena indicting and spiritual question. Can you unburn me? Hmm. That question comes before America every day. Can you unlinch us? Hmm. Can you unburn us? Can you unassassinate us? That's the agenda we have to work on day by day. And I'm just honored to be on this panel this hour with Progressive National Baptist Convention, thanks to the moderator and fellow panelists. As we raise the question on a daily basis, can you unlinch hmm. God's children? That's our assignment. Wow. Uh, kind of just need to let that simmer. That, 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 that's, that, that's powerful. Thank you so much, Doc. So, so Dr. Bryant, given that wisdom, that prophetic insight that we just received, can you unburn us? The, the struggle is basically in this country eternal. And of course, it's been exacerbated during uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And now COVID-19 is disproportionately killing our communities because of the social determinants uh, we alluded to earlier. What now is the role? What can the black church, you're in Georgia. I don't need to say anything to you about your governor uh, who's declared war on your city and yes. your mayor. Uh, you're in Georgia uh, with a governor who basically stole his way to the governorship. And now he's presiding over uh, COVID-19. And there's so much that goes with this from uh, in Florida, they're talking about forcing schools to open uh, disproportionately. We're not getting tested. So what is the role of the black church in COVID-19 as it relates to protecting our community so we fight to be unburned, unlynched, and unassassinated? First, uh, thank you, Dr. Haynes, for allowing me uh, the privilege to share and to think out loud. This is uh, my debutante ball as a Baptist, uh, <laughs> AME, <laughs> life. So this is uh, my first dance, and I'm, I'm appreciative just to be a part. Uh, before I uh, go forward, Dr. Haynes, um, I have to pause uh, because in the last three months, uh, we have lost Dr. Joseph Lowry, C.T. Vivian, and uh, the Honorable John Lewis. Uh, yes. So I don't take lightly being on the platform with uh, Dr. Otis Moss, right. uh, knowing that uh, he and uh, Ambassador Andy Young are the last uh, of that group. And so to have uh, one of the pillars of the movement on with us, uh, I'm humbled and honored, sir, just to be on the platform with you. Uh, I want to uh, piggyback on uh, Dr. Moss's statement, can you unlinch us? And the answer as the question is rhetorical is resoundingly no. But I think our responsibility, uh, Dr. I, is to at least cut the rope down. Uh, they can't uh, unlinch us, but they're letting the body just swing. Uh, and so now here we are in August, and uh, the body of Brianna is still swinging in the air uh, because we haven't cut the rope down. Right. Uh, we still haven't had uh, the police officers stand trial for Ahmad uh, or for uh, George Floyd, and they're hoping to attire uh, us out. Uh, we got to figure out how to cut this rope down with voter suppression. Uh, now in our backyard with what we just witnessed recently, in Kentucky and Alabama, where they're minimizing polling stations uh, for African Americans. We are just, um, uh, we'll are just uh, two steps away from counting bubbles out of a soap uh, before it is that we're able to vote. Uh, most of my life as a product 
of the NAACP has been on voter registration, get out to vote, voter education. This is my very first time uh, in this civil rights fight advocating for early voting and absentee voting. Uh, those are not models uh, that I have, but now that we're gonna have to push as they are shrewdly and diabolically trying to figure out how to use COVID to their advantage in this election cycle. Uh, we've got uh, several areas uh, that are so critical. Uh, we just uh, finalized uh, uh, Dr. Vivian and uh, Representative Law, uh, Lewis, uh, both of whom were ordained clergy. And what they modeled for us is that their platform was the pavement. Uh, if you do a Google image search of both C.T. Vivian and John Lewis, the photos you will find of them will not be behind a podium, will not be holding a microphone, but they understood that their microphone was Montgomery. Uh, so I think that the charge for us uh, in this hour has been expedited because of COVID uh, to come outside of the four walls and to really prophetically cry loud and spare not. You talked about uh, medical apartheid that is uh, uh, really being uh, pushed through because of my governor here in Georgia, who is suing my mayor for asking us to wear masks. Uh, and if you can even imagine this, Dr. Carruthers, he just uh, last month, uh, July, filed an injunction to block the mayor of Atlanta from having press conferences, uh, saying that she should be able to speak to the crisis, that he should be the lone and the singular voice. Uh, and so how it is that uh, we do this whole uh, balancing act of Cirque du Soleil, of trying to pick, do we fight COVID or corruption? Uh, this is a glaring reminder that Black people don't have the luxury of choosing one fight, uh, that we've got to deal with several at the same time. Now, in order for us to uh, cut down that rope necessitates a knife. Uh, and so we've got to use uh, the sharp sword of the spirit uh, to be able to advance our cause. And uh, regrettably, uh, we are preaching a passive aggressive gospel uh, that doesn't uh, really expose God militaristic uh, that this is not a kumbaya moment, but this is really uh, the fight of our lives of what is going to happen. Uh, we got to deal with, I'm grateful uh, Dr. Francois just graduated, uh, but the church is going to have to wrestle with the idea that an entire class graduated to the next grade with no proof of proficiency. Uh, we we got to put in the place that none of them took any standardized tests. None of them had access to SATs. We are dealing with this distance learning and nobody is discussing the digital divide. I just canceled last week, Willie, our church was uh, pulling together uh, a back to school uh, project and I just canceled it and said, why are we giving out backpacks to Negroes going to the living room? Uh, what they need is hotspots and, and Wi-Fi and laptops, uh, and none of that is being provided. We're not talking about the throngs of our young people who are now on special education and what will happen for them. We're not giving any discussion that we are trusting homeschooling to parents who didn't go to PTA. Uh, and so we've got a whole lot of things that we have to unpack. So the protesting, the fight and the quest for justice cannot be limited to just police brutality. Uh, but what you're talking about with uh, medical apartheid, the digital divide, food insecurity, uh, economic uh, issues, all of that, August of the month that uh, Progressive is meeting, if you all can uh, handle this, is gonna be the largest evictions of Americans in over 40 years. The largest evictions last right. night, uh, ordinarily, if we were at the Progressive uh, Convention uh, physically, all of us would have been coming downstairs from the hotel uh, and met in the lobby and then went to whatever ballroom they told us this panel was going in. We're doing it virtually because of COVID. 
Last night in America, 1.3 million people slept in their car. Uh, Cornell West talks about uh, America being the only place where you have the working poor, that you've got a 40 hour job uh, and still don't have enough to sustain your family. Uh, and so no, we cannot unlinch, unmaim, or uncastrate, uh, but we can do something to cut the knife, cut the rope down and figure out is there still vital signs for those who have been strung up? Uh, and we're finding ourselves in Ezekiel's daydream. Can we live? And only God knows at this point. But I'm believing that a generation like uh, Dr. Francois is uh, hyperventilating on uh, millennials and Gen Xers and Zs that there is possibility uh, because we don't want to uh, really wake up in Vietnam flashbacks having to go through the exact same thing again. I wish uh, at my highest level uh, that Dr. Moss was on today to tell us how things used to be. Uh, I shudder that this is just a run on sentence, that we are still dealing with the exact same thing here in 2020. My Lord, my Lord, what, thank you so much for that. Dr. Francois, uh, Dr. Bryant just listed for us many of the uh, current challenges that are, again, a run-on sentence uh, for what it means to be Black in the disunited States of America. And again, you're talking about the digital divide, internet inequality. You're talking about uh, kids going to school or not. If they do go to school, uh, they may be walking into uh, a death hot spot. Uh, that they then bring home if they don't go to school? What kinds of wraparound services will they miss out on? Because many children in Dallas, where I am, uh, depend on school for mm -hmm. breakfast and for lunch. Uh, and, and we can call the roll. So COVID-19 is, is, is exposing, uh, as Bishop William Barber says, so many of the breakages, the fissures, uh, in society. I want to ask you, uh, Dr. Francois, given these challenges of COVID-19, what kinds of practical things can you share with this progressive audience of pastors, of lay leaders, what kinds of practical things can they do in their respective churches, in their respective locales to address these COVID-19 issues that are run on sentences from COVID-16-19. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haynes, for your leadership here and to the Progressive Convention for uh, the foresight of, of gathering this, this kind of, this, this cadre of, of thinkers and, and, and liberationists. Um, I, I think that what, what needs to be underscored is that the, the profound uh, the, the profound trauma that this pandemic, this public health pandemic has inflicted upon uh, non-white bodies, non-white communities is because of the pre-existing conditions in our economic body. Right? There's something in the economic body of America that has always been defined by the exploitation of Black labor, the exploitation of Black genius, uh, and the attempted uh, genocide of, of non-white bodies, whether uh, there's those, uh, those African bodies that were transported here and seasoned uh, in very terroristic ways across the Atlantic, or those native, uh, those indigenous bodies uh, that saw this land as sacred and developed it uh, in ways uh, that that white Europeans have never been able to develop land. So there has to be this acknowledgement of the pre-existing conditions in our economic bodies uh, that, uh, that are related to the pre-existing conditions in the individual bodies that have made us deeply vulnerable to, to this pandemic and to, to this virus. But there are some, I mean, just simply, I, I think that churches, although uh, churches are not assembled in this moment, uh, that we are still activated to, to do the work of democracy first responding uh, is that as as black Christians uh, as black folk we have always been uh, the chief defenders of democracy and we have been the only first responders of democracy as people have been victimized by this experiment that has looked more like kleptocracy than it has been a democracy uh, and it has been the black church
church uh, that has at black churches, uh, uh, unnamed women and, and children, uh, and, and some brothers who have gotten some shine that have always been uh, protecting and guaranteeing uh, of that America can be what it says it is on paper. So one of the very practical things that churches can do, that black churches can do particularly, is to reclaim that heritage of first responders of democracy. It is because of the black church that we had the Voting Rights Act of, of 65. It's because of the black church that we had Civil Rights Act of 64. It's because of the black church even that we had the Fair Housing Act of 68. It's the black church that has animated the Demo that has animated and realized the democratic imagination of this nation that did not start as a democracy but started as a colonial imperialist project that that lived on stolen land and stolen labor. And so part of what we have to do is reclaim our, 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 our role in policy advocacy. And policy advocacy can start even while we are at home. There's so many platforms that have been created, whether it's Outvote that helps us to organize and that helps us to organize and move people to the polls, whether it is social media that allows us to launch messages uh, around around the, the process for mail-in voting, right? Uh, or whether it's it's the, the, the role that we must take in, in, in convincing and insisting that black people, uh, that black and brown people and poor folk uh, fill out the census. Like these are, these are things that are deeply practical, engaging our elected officials. Like it's, it's hard to say that we as churches are interested in anti-poverty when we don't know our state legislators and we don't know our, our congressional representatives, right? It's hard to say that we're interested in decarceration. Right now in, in New Jersey, we have been demanding uh, that Governor Murphy, who presides over one of the most liberal progressive states in the union, but has the greatest racial disparity in incarceration. And that we are noticing that the most impacted population by COVID-19 is uh, our brothers and sisters who are incarcerated, who are being warehoused in what are petri dishes, cauldrons of the, vi of, of the virus because of lack of ventilation, lack of sanitation, a lack of the capacity to distance, right? The, the lack of how we see humanity. So one of the first things that we must do practically is to figure out how do we now reclaim the responsibility of putting pressure on our elected officials to push forward an equity agenda that honors the fact that there are pre-existing economic conditions that are that is exaggerating this crisis and realizing that I, 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 I'm with Dr. Dr. Bryant, that one of the key things that we need to be arguing for right now, that we need to add to our litany of things that, that that model uh, equity is that there needs to be universal broad universal access to broadband internet right that you have children who are now at home and they don't have and they don't have equal access to this learning opportunity because they don't have equal access to these particular uh, to these particular devices in particular uh, uh, internet that has been considered a a privilege for the few and not really a right for all. So there has to be this policy conversation that needs to happen. Now, what black churches have potential have have done well is that we practice what what uh, Howard Thurman calls neighborliness. Well, we, we we know how to give away food. We we know how to give away uh, clothes, right? And so we at, at this point we have to figure out how do we amplify uh, that kind of work. How do we expand uh, that kind of work? Because we're living with communities who are experiencing unemployment in ways that they've never seen before. I live in Atlantic City. I live in Atlantic City, and we have, have seen the complete evisceration of our economy uh, in, during the crash of 08 when people were not able to come and spend in our, in our, uh, in our single industry economy, and that is the, the casinos. And we also experienced one of the greatest housing crises because of that. But we're seeing something akin to that, if not more, 
uh, because of this single industry uh, city, this single industry economy that our city is based in, that now that our now that our casinos are not open, that you have more and more people who used to volunteer at food pantries who are now the beneficiaries of food pantry. And so we have to figure out how do we amplify these sort of direct service engagements that that our communities require without allowing that to limit the kind of social justice structural engagement that we have been uh, required uh, to do, required to think deeply about. That we are in a moment where we, what we need in addition to these, the, in addition to trying to connect our seniors to the internet uh, with whatever types of tutorials we're able to do we have to figure out how do we connect our seniors to the internet, whether that is just developing some type of, of basic proficiency, or if it's figuring out how to develop the resources to pay uh, for certain access to, to, to pay for certain access to devices and, 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 and systems. We have to figure out what does it mean to connect our seniors to this new digital world. Uh, we have to figure out what it means to protect our teachers who are now debating whether or not they should retire because they're, the job that they've invested in for 20, 30 years is now a death sentence for some of them because we know that although our communities are lacking black teachers because the profile of teachers right currently as it always been has been white women but those of us who have been privileged to have black teachers we know many of them are suffering from those comorbidities that are leading to these high fatality rates in communities of color so we have to figure out how do we protect teachers in the middle of this crisis how are we protecting nurses in our schools how are we protecting uh, uh, persons who are responsible for for keeping the school plants safe we have to start thinking through this idea of as democracy democracy first responders, how are we protecting bodies with all of the resources uh, that we have, with all of the creativity and all of the imagination that we have. So we got to continue to do the direct civic engagement, the direct civic engagement, even if that's digital engagement. We have to figure out how to augment and increase our direct service work because we live in, in we live in food apartheid, right? We, we, we live in job apartheid. And so we have to figure out how do we augment our direct service work through collaborations, through local organizations who have all of these resources and they don't know where to throw this money at. The black churches are, I think, great, uh, are, are great examples of places that can push forward these resources into impacted communities. But we have to also do this hard thing, and that is we need a cellular restructuring, the restructuring of our theologies. Our theologies are terminal, our theologies are killing us, and if we don't figure out how to undo the theological terror of white supremacy that is living in black pulpits, we are doing nothing more than perpetuating the kind of theology and thinking that that affirms and reaffirms that black lives don't matter. One of the key things we gotta do, uh, Doc, and, and, and I'm done, is that we have to figure out how do we reclaim a Palestinian carpenter and not perpetuate this Americanized Christ. We have to figure out how do we reclaim a Jesus that understands what it means to be a part of a lynched class, to be a part of a crucified class, to be a part of an incarcerated class, to be a part of a community that lives with their backs up against the wall being chased by the three hounds of hell, according to Howard Thurman. We have to reclaim a Jesus that 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 is is in direct opposition to this Americanized white Jesus that convinces us that our suffering is somehow redemptive and our suffering is somehow in the will of God. My, 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 my. Thank you for that. Thank you. We need deliverance from white Jesus. Get connected to the right Jesus because uh, God knows the white Jesus has been an instrument of terror for us. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to just throw this out. Of, and all of you, uh, I don't want you to be shy. Please feel free to respond. Uh, it would be irresponsible of me to not bring up uh, the fact that there is an idiom in democracy that says elections have consequences. This is 2020, and if elections have consequences, 
we are living right now in the consequences of the election of 2016. Uh, we lack a coordinated strategic national response to COVID-19 that has created hundreds of thousands of deaths. Uh, what the toll is right now, it continues to mount. Uh, in excess of 140,000 people have died, many needlessly, because of the consequences of the election in 2016 that put in the Oval Office, uh, Dr. Moss, your son, Otis Moss III, refers to him as COVID-45. And so, <laughs> so it may well be that, and I've said this, and I think it's, it, it, it's borne out sadly, 11-9-2016, uh, we awaken to the results of November the 8th, Tuesday, November 8th. And I maintain that historians will declare that 11-9 was our moral 9-11 uh, because elections have consequences. Given the gravity of 2020 elections, what is the role? What, what, what are we supposed to be doing as the black church during the 2020 elections? Uh, I, I, and, and I want to push us because I don't want us to limit it to, okay, getting out the vote. Yeah, we got that. Uh, but, but this is the 2020 where COVID-45 is going to allow Russia to hack this election. Facebook has basically said, hands off, do whatever you want to do. Uh, voter suppression by the Republicans is being unleashed. What is our role? What can we do as prophetic witnesses for this 2020 election? That's for all of us. I'll jump in. Uh, our favorite uh, people, Dr. Haynes, are uh, white evangelicals who have taught us a monumental people, principle that I think our people have failed in. The evangelicals, almost to a fault, have held on to principles, no matter how skewed or off demented they may be. They hold on to principles where we have uh, somehow or another pushed our people around personalities. Uh, and so there's a drum on, I'm not excited about Biden. Well, I got to see who the running mate is going to be. Evangelicals, I don't care who it is, as uh, long as they don't mess with our two pet issues, same-sex marriage and abortion, right. we're we going to be three blind mice for everything else. Um, uh, <laughs> Dr. Moss would know better uh, than I, the stalwart, who said there's no permanent friends, it's just permanent interests. Uh, and so the reality is, as uh, you named him, 46 minus one, uh, is that he didn't get elected, Dr. Haynes, from all the people that voted for him. He got elected from all the people that didn't go vote. Uh, and so we've got to really just show out that map uh, of why this is really the urgency of now, 2.0, uh, and really get them put, it don't matter who Biden, pulls in, uh, we've got to push it. Because if this is how reckless this president was in the first term, uh, the second term uh, is going to be good morning Saigon. So we, we're going to have to really uh, amp up our voices so that people know that this is not an elective, but this is course curriculum, that you owe this. you got to go vote. Uh, and I, I don't know how it, much more to do it. I'm clamoring now. Uh, Dr. I, because 60% of those in DeKalb County in Atlanta still have not filled out their census reports. And they're home. And they're sitting on the coffee table uh, and don't understand what that means and what is the impact of you not doing it and what is the benefit of you doing it. And so we're going to have to have what has been lost from public schools. Uh, you talked about the turning the pulpit into a platform, a civics class is what's gonna have to happen. Uh, and it's not just the top of the ticket, but all the way down. Who are these attorneys? Who are these judges? What are these bills that we're mandating up for? What are we demanding of the Black Caucus to do? All of that has to happen 
our collective mentor, Dr. Jeremiah Wright, often said, uh, everybody who's our color is not our kind. Uh, and so <laughs> once we realize we're not just voting black, uh, we got to vote what's right. Uh, and so that's going to have to happen in every sector, every neck of the woods. The NAACP years ago, I don't know if they still do it, used to give out a report card. Uh, about uh, people's voting uh, history and how they voted on the issues that lined up with our community. If they're not doing it any further, we got to tap President uh, Derek uh, to put that back out again uh, and give a report card to those who are allegedly offering themselves up for public service. Thank you, thank you. Listen, I'm being told that we have to wrap this. So what I wanna do is I'm asking all of you uh, in give me 60 seconds of how we should be reimagining social justice in 2020. Well, I, I'll start and I, I will just say that one of the ways I think we have to reimagine it is uh, by an effort to start a conversation around what it means to be human and that mm -hmm. the Jesus that we're talking about, the Palestinian Jew, uh, has to be situated in African identity. Come on. And it is the assaulted African identity that has gotten us to the point where we don't even feel worthy. My Lord. Which is why some things are on the living room table or the dining room table being ignored. And I think the reclamation of the divinity within is a part of the call that gets us to begin to raise that question of what is it? What is our North Star about what it means to be human? because we are up against, against a system that is antithetical to the very notion of humanity. I think that's what the Black church has given. It has given us a space, a place to be human and to, to model what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And at this point, we're talking about dismantling systems of economies, political nation state systems, et cetera, even the control over the genome and the genetic has been commodified in ways that destroy the potentiality for us to live as God would have us to live. And so we're torn between a theology of scarcity, which says it's not enough and therefore we're gonna fight each other over the crumbs versus a theology of prosperity, which says some of us are so grounded in individualism, it's okay for us to have it all and some to have nothing. Hmm. And I think that we have got to dig into that well of our African identity that begins to inform a different way forward. It is a values of revolution that Martin Luther King talked about. It's the reclamation of what it means to believe that I am because you are and we are. It is the reclamation of Ubuntu that I hope that will allow us to understand the difference between charity that so many of our ministries have been engaged in and justice, which is a totally different quest. Come on, Doc, come on. I think also, and thank you again, we must raise intentionally some critical, dangerous questions. Is there a callous, genocidal calculation that the 100, almost 50,000 deaths COVID-19 will mean for some people fewer voters and therefore a greater opportunity for a majority white minority coming minority white racist element to continue to rule that might be a dangerous question hmm. but why is it how is it that there is so little concern at the top about the deaths of tens of thousands of people on a daily basis. My Lord. Yeah. As someone looked at this in the dark corridors of iniquity and said, let them die because they are likely to be voters against us if they are registered, come on, exercise their franchise. 
I know these are disturbing questions, but these are some of the kinds of discussions that we must have. What kind of empathy or sympathy have we seen from the administration in the face of almost now 150,000 deaths? It's more than just insensitivity. I think someone wants them to die. Yeah. And we must raise that question and yeah. force them into responding. Yeah. Say that, say that. Dr. Bryant. I think that uh, our prophetic responsibility is to go uh, in the opposite direction of the recommendation of CDC. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, as prophets in this hour, we can't wear a mask. Uh, I think that we have uh, muted uh, our voice and have forgotten that the gospel is offensive and controversial. Uh, secondarily, we got to make sure we don't wash our hands of the problem, uh, that we've got to be hands on even if it gets dirt on us. Uh, and if we're to uh, really take charge of the least of these, we cannot practice social distancing. We got to get closer to those who are wounded and fractured and broken. Uh, and to become one with them. I think our responsibility is to be mindful that we are all carriers of grace and we want everybody to get infected. Say that. Dr. Francois, 60 seconds. Unmuted. Um, uh, first thing we have to do is we need a, we need a theological imagination that believes in the impossible. We can't keep constraining ourselves to what the, the windows of possibility of political possibility tell us. We need to be clear right now that there are certain things that they say is impossible, like free health care, free college, uh, the abolition of student loan debt. When we have a theological imagination that goes beyond the possible, we are saying that we don't limit ourselves to what other people tell us is possible. We need to decide whether we are, secondly, we got to decide whether we are going to practice plantation religion or we're going to practice Bruce Harbor spirituality. Our ancestors went out into the clearings, worshiping God, uh, owning their humanity, even if it cost them their lives. It was dangerous to worship in the woods. It was dangerous to do ring shots in the woods. And so we got to figure out, are we willing to do work that's going to cost us something? Because ministry that does not cost us is too American. And we've been too American for too long. We need a clear strategy like I, I agree with Dr. Dr. Brown, we got to we gotta do what our white evangelical brothers do. We need to start owning the judiciary the way they own the judiciary. One thing I love about Dr. Moss and his generation is that they knew how to use the courts to do what the president and what the Congress could not do. We need to figure out as black people how to use the judiciary in ways that honor our values, honor our commitments. And lastly, we gotta do what W.E.B. Du Bois and, and Angela Davis says, we need abolitionist democracy. We gotta tear down stuff that doesn't work and rebuild it. Don't reform it. They didn't ask for slavery reform. They asked for slave abolition. <laughs> And so we can start calling it abolition democracy. And that may be abolishing the stuff that we think protects us. But guess what? If you really look at it, the stuff we say protects us has actually been preying on us at our own expense. Because we pay police officers with our tax dollars to protect us, but they prey on us in too many cases. My Lord, my Lord, Lord have mercy. Progressive. Listen, I know, I know, I, I hear you out there, even in the virtual world, you're saying, do you really have to end this panel right now? Listen, I don't want to, but you got another session to go to tonight. And I don't want you to miss the session because it's going down like four flat tires. You don't want to miss it, but just let the president know. Let Jewel London and all of them know. This is the greatest session in all of the convention. It's the session of all sessions. And next time we need more time because when you have this kind of panel, OM to the Jeezy, you know it's going to be prophetically powerful. And again, if we just take all that we've learned today, an explosive revolution will take place and 2020 will not be just known for COVID-19 and COVID-16-19, 
but it will be known for a revolution, a prophetic revolution. Thank you, Dr. Carruthers, of values where we transform not just ourselves with the theological injection of, of what is needed by way of liberating prophetic witness, but also will transform this nation, this American empire, because I'm afraid if we don't do it, if we don't do it, we are witnessing the decline of this empire. We are witnessing the decline of the American empire. What is our prophetic responsibility in the midst of an empire that practices, Dr. Moss, what Brittany Cooper calls necropolitics, the politics of death, where we are comfortable with the deaths of the othered. We cannot settle for that. We need a resurrection a resurrection of life from our resurrected revolutionary, Jesus the Christ. But now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or imagine, according to the power at work in us, to God be the glory in Christ Jesus, now and forever, we shall overcome. Amen. Amen. Amen.